Well, good morning. Today we're going to um, start on Chapter 7. Um, remember, after Chapter 7, um, we have our third quiz. So that'll be next week sometime. Um, as always, the quizzes are going to be very heavy into the tutorials. So do practice the tutorials from 6. And we'll get to a couple here in seven, and that's what your quiz is going to be. Again, there's 20 points, and let's just make sure we don't lose any of those easy points. Now, chapter seven is actually a very pleasant chapter. Um, we're going to review some concepts about bonding, polar bonds, and things like that. And then we're going to um, look at lots of pretty pictures and then after the pretty pictures we're finally going to get to a concept called molarity moles per liter and we'll do a few calculations based on that uh, chapter seven is not real con or calculation intensive not quite like six <clears throat> um, Chapter 8 gets a little more interesting in terms of calculations because we're going to do acidity. But let's go ahead and get started with the review. We talked a long time ago about bonding. We said that there were two types of bonding, covalent and ionic. Covalent bonding could be represented by something like chlorine, where we have two shared electrons between our two chlorines. Ionic, something like sodium chloride. In this, we actually share the electrons between both atoms. And here, we totally transfer the electron from sodium to the chlorine. These actually represent the limits of bonding. If you have a covalent bond between atoms that are identical, then yeah, you pretty much have nice equal sharing. But we'll see that for most covalent bonds, that the distribution of electrons is not uniform. And that's interesting because that's what gives um, compounds their particular and unique reactivity. As we said, with something like chlorine, chlorine is a group seven element. Therefore, in our Lewis structure, we have seven valence electrons. In order to make CO2, we simply have to bring another chlorine up. We allow them to share these electrons. When we do our count, remember we count the shared electrons twice. So this chlorine has an octet. And this one does too. So this is perfect sharing. As we know, um, we can do a shortcut on our Lewis structure here, putting our dash in um, instead of the dots. And whenever we see the dash connecting atoms, we know that that represents two shared electrons. All right. We've looked at hydrogen and hydrogen fluoride before. <clears throat> With hydrogen, we have two hydrogen atoms, a covalent bond between them, and we would expect the sharing between these two atoms to be identical. We can <clears throat> um, check that, if you will, with our electrostatic potential map. Now remember, an electrostatic potential map is a, the result of a calculation. What we'll do is we'll take hydrogen and we will calculate where around these two atoms the electrons are. You have to draw a limit somewhere. It's usually 9% probability of where you'll find the electrons, and then you draw a surface. In order to make the electrostatic potential map, you simply color that surface. You color it based on the electron distribution. 
Now, it's not, it's not exactly right. Um, the, the calculation actually brings a point charge up to the surface here and measures the response of the electron cloud to that. But the charge distribution is a pretty good way to explain that. So for hydrogen, and this is on the same scale, so our two hydrogen atoms are here, we have a very nice uniform distribution. Slightly egg-shaped, but nice and green uniform color. For hydrogen fluoride, however, the electrostatic potential map is much, much different. Remember in an electrostatic potential map, we use color to show electron distribution. Blue means we don't have enough electrons. And red means we have an excess of electrons. So in this covalent bond between the hydrogen and the fluorine, the electrons are being drawn down towards the fluorine end and away from the hydrogen. We'll see that this is very, very important in chapter um, 8 because this is what makes hydrogen fluoride an acid. But okay, the reason for this, as we've seen before, is because of the differences in electronegativity. Electronegativity is a, uh, just a number, basically from zero to four, and it increases in a ramp from this end of the periodic table all the way up to here. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Uh, its electronegativity is essentially 4, and hydrogen is here at 2.2. Electronegativity is a measure of the ability of an atom to attract electrons towards itself. So this is why the bond in HF is so skewed. Fluorine, very electronegative, sucks the electrons up towards itself, and we have a polar covalent bond. So that's our background here. When we have a polar covalent bond, again, here's our difference in electronegativity, we show that with a dipole. Remember, a dipole is an arrow. You'll put a plus at one end of the arrow, and it'll look something like this. What you do is you align it with the pointy end towards the electron density and the positive end here, the plus sign, where we have less electron density. So we would say that the polar covalent bond in HF is polarized. This is our dipole moment. Basically, it's a dipole starting here and going here. Any questions? All right, I'd like to expand this conversation now to water. <clears throat> Chapter 7, we're going to be dealing with aqueous solutions. And what we're going to see is that the dipole associated with water is what makes water such a unique and marvelous solvent. So let's start off with simply the Lewis structure for water. We haven't drawn Lewis structures for a while. Go ahead and draw it for me. Oxygen is group six. Hydrogen, of course, is group one. We start off with our oxygen. We will put six electrons around it. We will have two paired electrons and two single electrons. That's our oxygen. Hydrogen has one electron. We will arrange them, put them next to these unpaired electrons, something like this. And quite obviously, we can share the electrons now between the oxygen and the hydrogens and show this 
with our dashed bonds. Now, in general chemistry, you will meet something called the valence shell electron repulsion theory. Okay? We're not going to talk about that in 110, but what that basically describes is the geometry of a molecule. And it's based on the number of things around the central atom. Here we have an oxygen, we have two hydrogens attached, and we have two unshared pairs of electrons. So there are four things around it. And what the valence shell electron repulsion theory says is that this is going to arrange itself in such a way that all the electrons, all the bonds, are going to be as far apart from each other as they can. When you look at the actual structure of water, this is referred to as bent. If you count up all four things here, this is a tetrahedral, tetrahedron, tetrahedral geometry. In a tetrahedral, all of these things are as far apart as they can possibly be. If you just look at the atoms, ignore the electrons, this looks like it's just bent with about a 109 degree angle. <clears throat> We refer to this geometry simply as bent. So this is what water looks like. <clears throat> uh, oxygen, and then we have two hydrogens coming out, again, 109 degrees or so in between. Now, if we think about the electronegativities of hydrogen and oxygen, look them up on our table. Hydrogen is about O2, 2.1, and oxygen is more electronegative. It's closer to the corner up here. Therefore, it's about three and a half. Now, that means that we're going to have a dipole between the hydrogen and the oxygen. <clears throat> the oxygen is going to draw the electrons away from the hydrogen, just like fluorine. So for each of these bonds, we're going to have little dipoles. Each of these are polar covalent bonds. But because water is a bent structure, these two dipoles are going to combine. And we're going to wind up with a molecular dipole. Molecular dipole is actually the vector sum of these two things. Mathematically, they're vectors. But the molecular dipole is going to look like this. That is, we predict that in water, this end, down by the hydrogens, is going to be positive. Both of these are positive things, aren't they? Up here, by the oxygen, where we're sucking in all these electrons, we predict this end of the molecule will be negative. Now we can calculate an electrostatic potential map for this. When we do this, it looks like this. Once again, here's our oxygen. Our hydrogens are here and here. And our dipole starts down here at the hydrogen end, working up towards the oxygen. So our conclusion here is that the OH bonds in water are polar. Because the geometry of water is bent, and we wind up with a molecular dipole, which we show in our electrostatic potential map here. The fact that water as this molecular dipole is the thing that's going to allow it 
to interact with ionic compounds, break apart the crystal structures, and draw them into solution. Remember, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. We learned that way back in chapter one. <clears throat> the unique thing about water that allows it to do this is the fact that it has this very pronounced molecular dipole. All right, let's look at a really cute little movie here. This represents a crystal of sodium chloride, and we're going to pretend it's in water. When I click the button, what's going to happen is that water molecules are going to come in, and they're going to grab. Sodium is the little silver thing. Chlorine is the green. So they're going to grab them one by one and whisk them away into solution. As they do this, I want you to pay particular attention to how the water interacts with these ions. Here goes a sodium and a chlorine. Now, take a look at this sodium cation and how, number one, it's surrounded by waters. Now, in this animation, um, this is a, a little bit of a simplification. The water shell around this would actually be larger, more waters. But look at the orientation of the water molecules relative to our positive charge. The red ends are all pointing towards the positives. Let's just watch it again and pay attention to the chlorine end. There goes a sodium. Here goes a chlorine. See how they're different? The whites are there. What you're doing as you lift these ions out is you're forming complexes with the water that look something like this. <clears throat> Here's our chloride anion, and you'll see we have all of the hydrogens pointing in towards the chlorine. That's because the hydrogen end is the positive end, isn't it? We're taking our negative charge here and we're stabilizing it by surrounding it with these positive ends of the water molecule. Over here, <clears throat> the sodium. The sodium is positive. The oxygen end of our dipole is negative. Therefore, we've surrounded the positive charge with these negative ions, or, or negative dipoles. The reason for doing this is that we wind up with a stabilization of the charge. Now let's look and see what that means. This represents a sodium cation, and this is its electrostatic potential map. Now, remember, blue means positive, right? So here's our big positive cation, and we've surrounded it here with only three waters, with the negative end of our dipoles pointing in. So let's remember what our sodium starts out looking like, big blue ball. What I'm going to do is calculate an electrostatic potential map for this whole complex. So step one. I figure out where the electrons are, what it looks like, then I color it for charge. Remember, we're starting with a big blue ball in the middle. This is what we wind up with. There's no more blue ball. 
blue ball, again, used to be right here. In fact, you see there's a yellow spot. What's happening is that these waters are very, very efficiently taking this positive charge and moving it out towards themselves. They're dispersing the positive charge. This is what we started with, big blue ball in the middle, and we wind up with no localized charge. Now, why is that important? Basically because nature really, really dislikes point charges. They are very, very, very unstable. Anything that you can do to, to stabilize a charge by spreading it out is a good thing. The thing that makes water such a wonderful and unique solvent, and why we say that when we look for life in space, we look for water. Why? Because water is unique in its ability to disperse charge like this. And because it can disperse charge, it can dissolve ions, and we'll see it can do all sorts of, of very interesting and important chemistry. Let's just look at some terminology. <clears throat> Make sure that everybody knows the words. If a substance dissolves in something, it is said to be soluble. The solubility gives the maximum amount of something that can dissolve in a given solvent. Okay? Um, let's say I tell you at 298 Kelvin, that's 25 degrees centigrade, magnesium carbonate has a solubility in water of 0.53 grams per liter. That is the solubility. In one liter of water, you can dissolve a little over half a gram of magnesium carbonate. So that's what we mean by solubility. When we have the maximum amount of stuff that can be dissolved, we say the solution is saturated. We'll see that we can actually go beyond that. We can trick the solution into becoming super saturated. We'll go do that in a second. Two other words. Solvent is a thing that does the dissolving. Water in this case. And solute is the thing that we are dissolving. So just make sure that we know the terminology. Saturated solution, the most you can get in, solvent, solute. When we speak of solubility, it's actually a number. Now, like I said, you can trick a solution into becoming not just saturated, but super saturated. The way you do that, typically solubility will increase as you raise the temperature. That's why solubility has to be defined at some temperature. If we raise the temperature, more will dissolve. And then if we very carefully let it cool, and we don't touch it, you can wind up with more dissolved than they're supposed to. That's super saturated. This is a really neat little movie. This is a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. All right. So again, what you did is you put sodium acetate in your little flask here, put in way too much, <clears throat> heat it up, it all dissolved, and then you allow it to cool back down to room temperature very, very slowly. Okay? So that's what this is. This is water with way too much sodium acetate in it. What's going to happen is somebody's going to drop a teeny tiny crystal of sodium acetate down the neck here. When it hits, it's going to set off crystallization. 
because, again, there's way too much, anything to disturb that, and boom, it goes back to being saturated. So let's watch. Boom, there it goes. You'll see immediately we start growing crystals. Crystals get bigger and bigger and bigger. And in this particular case, the flask essentially sets solid with the sodium acetate. What we're left with here, when it's all done, is a saturated solution now. So we're back to the maximum that can be dissolved at this temperature. So that's saturated. <clears throat> but again, this is all the stuff that was there when it was super saturated. Um, it's the interesting thing about this too, it actually gets hot. So think about the cycle here. You put energy into it and dissolve all this stuff, right? Then when it finally you induce crystallization, makes the crystals, and it gives off all this energy. So it actually gets very hot. This is an interesting way to store things like heat energy. Imagine you had a solar panel of some sort sitting out there in the sun, beautiful sunny day. <clears throat> you dissolve your stuff in <coughs> water uh, using your solar energy. Then the sun goes down and it gets cold, and you want it back. You induce crystallization, and it gets hot. It's actually an interesting way to, uh, to recycle something like excess solar energy. All right, let's talk about our rule of thumb for solubility. We saw that water interacted specifically with the ions in sodium chloride. It did it by surrounding the ions with the dipoles, right? Well, water can basically dissolve virtually anything that is a polar molecule. If you think about ethanol, this is the alcohol of consumption. CH3, CH2OH. The OH bond here is polar, just like the OH bonds in water. So alcohol can interact with water, and when it does, it dissolves. <coughs> alcohol, it turns out, is miscible in all proportions with water. That means you can mix it as much as you want, in any proportions you want, and it forms a clear solution. So that's miscible in all proportions. If we have something that is not polar, for example, oil, vegetable oil, olive oil, these are nonpolar CH bonds. And because they're nonpolar, <clears throat> water does not interact well with them doesn't interact well, it doesn't dissolve. So putting all this together, we can say our rule of thumb for solubility is simply like dissolves like. Water is polar, it will dissolve polar things. Oil is nonpolar, it will dissolve nonpolar. Very simple concept. <clears throat> One last thing I, I want to talk about here is the term electrolyte. Now, electrolyte is kind of an old term, an old concept. <clears throat> um, in general chemistry, you may actually use a measure of conductivity to follow kinetics of a reaction and stuff like that. So it's a, still an interesting sort of thing. The phenomena is that if you have a solution in which you have, so this is water, if you have an aqueous solution 
and you have ions dissolved in it. That solution will conduct electricity. If you have a solution, if you have water, and you don't have ions present, that solution will not conduct electricity. This is called an electrolyte, and that's a non-electrolyte. Very simple concept. Back in the old days, we used to do a lab <coughs> where we would take solutions. Um, this would have ions dissolved in it, hook it up to a power source, stick your little rods in, your light would glow, and you would say, oh yeah, that's an electrolyte. If you add something that did not form ions, <coughs> dissolve it in water, do not conduct electricity, and your little light does not glow. Conductivity is a measure of exactly how much is able to flow through it. And again, um, you can do that with a very sensitive conductivity meter, and that's what you may use in 140. Back in the old days again, <coughs> um, we didn't use batteries. We actually took this little guy and we just plugged it straight into the wall. Batteries were too expensive. Um, and they kind of stopped doing that experiment because, think about it, you have beakers full of salt water and you have 110 volts and you have freshmen. And all of that just didn't go together very well. The rule of thumb on electrolytes, if you're going to form ions, you will have a solution that conducts electricity. Something that forms ions is an electrolyte. This is glucose. Glucose, C6. H12O6. It's a sugar. It has all of these OH bonds. Because of that, it's very soluble in water, isn't it? But it does not ionize. There are no ions like there are in sodium chloride. Therefore, this dissolves, but it is a non electrolyte. Now, the real danger in talking about this stuff is that somebody's going to go home and say, here's my bathtub, and I need to curl my hair. I have no salt in my bathtub, so it's okay to sit in here with my curling iron, right? I wouldn't do that. Because remember, <laughs> there's enough salt in the Chicago waters um, to really fry you very quickly. But if you have absolutely pure water, it is not a conductor. Any questions on the concepts? All right, let's take all of this and let's apply it to the concept of molarity. In molarity, we're going to deal with moles per liter. This is one mole in a liter of water. That is a one molar solution. Okay? We're going to define molarity. <clears throat> this is molarity. The abbreviation for this is an uppercase M. M is going to represent moles per liter. Now, it's very important, at least in terms of general chemistry, that you recognize this is an uppercase M. Because in general chemistry, you meet something called molality, which is also a measure of concentration, but it's a lowercase M. And the two are different. So, uppercase M, molarity. The definition of molarity is simply moles of solute 
divided by the volume of our solution in liters. Moles per liter. Now, as we make a solution of known molarity, we're going to use a volumetric flask. <clears throat> volumetric flask has a big bottom like this. And at a given temperature, this is filled with liquid. There's a little tiny line etched right here at the skinny part. When this has exactly one liter <coughs> of liquid in this container, the liquid will come exactly that little edge line. Now you can get volumetrics in virtually all sizes, but we're going to use the one liter um, because that's our definition. Now in order to make a solution of known molarity, what you have to do is take your solute. We'll take a certain um, mass, a certain number of grams, and we're going to put it in our volumetric flask here. <clears throat> Here's our cell. It's important that you put it in first because the solute it's going to have its own volume, isn't it? And we must be able to bring this up to exactly one liter. So you start off by putting your solute in your flask. Then we're going to dilute this all the way up to the one liter mark. Since we know how much stuff we put in, how many moles, and we know our volume, is exactly one liter, we can calculate molarity as simply moles per liter. Simple concept, right? Now you know when we did reactions, <clears throat> we did double displacements, for example. Those are reactions that occur in solution, aren't they? Stoichiometry applies for those. We balanced all those equations. Using the concept of molarity, we can take solutions of known concentration, and we can do quantitative reactions. Let's see how we do this. Let's say I take 3.25 grams of sodium bromide, and I dissolve it. So our total volume of solution is 1,250 milliliters. What is the molarity of my solution? We remember <coughs> that molarity is moles per liter. We know a molar mass for sodium bromide. What do we remember? What do we say every night? Mass over molar mass is moles, right? So we know how many moles of sodium bromide we have. We are given a volume in terms of milliliters. We simply must convert that to liters. Mass over molar mass is moles. <clears throat> now remember, we're going to take our number of moles, and we're going to divide it by our number of liters. 1,250 milliliters is 1.25 liters. Our grams here are going to cancel, aren't they? And here we have per mole in our denominator. <clears throat> Grams cancel, per mole comes up top. It's the reciprocal of a reciprocal. 
So our numerator has units of moles. Our denominator has units of liters. We do our calculation. This is 0 0.2, moles per liter. We can leave it that way, or we could also say 0 0.0253 molar. Uppercase M, molar. Whenever you see molar, remember it's the same as moles per liter. Any questions? We saw sodium acetate in a supersaturated solution. Here I'm going to take 6.47 grams of sodium acetate, 83, 82 grams per mole. 1450 is my volume. What's the molarity? Quickly calculate it. Take our mass, divided by our molar mass, that'll give us moles. Divide that by our volume in liters, and we get molarity. Mass over molar mass. Divide by liters. Grams cancel. Per mole comes up. This is 0.0544 moles per liter, or 0.0544 molar. Now, as you can imagine, there are lots of different ways to formulate these types of problems. Here we were simply given a mass and a volume, and we calculated molarity. What if we looked at a problem like this? This is sucrose, sugar, C12H22O11. <clears throat> we have molar mass of 342 grams per mole. We want to know how much sugar we need to put in 150 mils. To make a solution, this 0.25 molar. Now, you know, this is really just our standard problem here, isn't it? Because we know moles divided by volume is molar. All we don't know here is how many moles we need. So first of all, we have to calculate how many moles of sucrose there are in 150 mils of 0.25 molar sucrose. Once we know how many moles there are, since we know the molar mass, we can get grams. Our moles of sucrose. We have 0.25 molar stuff, right? That's 0.25 moles in one liter. If we multiply that by liters here, 0.15 liters, our liters would cancel, wouldn't they? And we would be left with moles. Now, I'm going to write this a slightly different way. 0.25 moles per liter. Once again, this is how you'll probably see it on exams, because it's much easier to do that than to put in slashes and whatever. The negative exponent simply means per liter, and of course, this is liter. All right, per liter and liter cancel. 
multiply these two together, 0.0375 moles of sucrose in 150 mils of 0.25 molar stuff. In order to <clears throat> get the number of grams mass, all we have to do is take our molar mass, 342 grams per mole, our number of moles here, that's our given, Moles will cancel. Oh, here, I drew it out the long way too. Mole and per mole will cancel. And we're left only with grams. To two significant figures, we're looking at 13 grams of sugar. So another way to say this is if we took Boy, uh, took 13 grams of sugar in 150 mils. That's a 0.25 molar solution. Same simple equation. We're just going to rearrange it in different ways. Molarity. The tutorial. Molarity one. Basically, all you're going to do here is fill in the missing thing in our table. <clears throat> On Blackboard, it looks just like this. You have a hole somewhere that you have to fill in. We are given the number of moles. We're given a volume in liters. All we have to do is take our number of moles, divided by our number of liters, 0.454 molar. Remember, no units, not here, not on blackboard. Let's do it again. If we have a solution that's 0.154 molar, and we know that in this solution we have 0.655 moles, what volume is our solution? You're just going to take your equation. Moles divided by volume is molarity. Rearrange it and solve it for volume. Moles. Divided by molarity, and you'll notice sometimes um, molarity is shown with an underscore, um, just to make sure everyone realizes that it's molarity we're talking about. Um, sometimes in textbooks it will also be written as a script, uppercase script help, stands for molarity. So, moles divided by moles per liter, moles cancels, per liter comes up, and this is 4.26 liters. If we have 2.92 liters of a 0.125 molar solution. How many moles do we have? Take your basic solution or basic equation. Moles divided by volume is molarity, and just solve it for moles. Moles will be volume multiplied by moles per liter. Moles per liter times volume gives us moles. Plug it in. 0.365 moles.
Let's do one more. <clears throat> this is molarity 2. Now, molarity 2 differs from molarity 1 in that instead of um, a table, you have a word problem. But it's the same sort of thing. <clears throat> the one thing that differs here is that sometimes you're asked to express this in funny units. So here we want our answer in terms of milligrams. Okay, just practice, that's all. We have 0.772 liters. Our molarity is 1.13. And we're looking for the mass of methanol that's in there. Remember, your basic equation, molarity is moles divided by liters. Here we need to solve for moles, and then convert it to grams, and then to milligrams. <clears throat> Concentration multiplied by volume is going to give us moles. Plug them in. 1.13 molar. We have 0.772 liters. We're dealing with 0.872 moles. Now if we know that one mole of methanol weighs 32 grams, we have 0.7 or 0.872 moles. Simply multiply these, we wind up with 27.9 grams of methanol. Now because the problem here, and on blackboard, wants you to do it in terms of milligrams. <clears throat> All you have to do is convert grams to milligrams, multiplied by a thousand, and that's 27,900 milligrams. So just like molarity one, except where you've got this little milligram nonsense, and it's a word problem. Look at this one. We're looking for a volume. Here's our concentration. We want 0.0879 moles. Remember, moles divided by volume is molarity. So we simply arrange that to solve for our volume. Remember, the volume is going to be in liters, isn't it? Once we get that, we remember that there are a thousand mils in every liter, so multiply it by a thousand. Number of moles divided by molarity is going to give us liters. <clears throat> Plug it in. 0.0879 moles. That's it. We have 1.75 molar. <clears throat> Moles cancel. And we're left with 0.0502 liters. Every liter is 1,000 milliliters, so we multiply this by 1,000. And it's 50 mils. Any questions? All right, well, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll do part two of molarity.
Friday. Don't have class. Oh, that's right. You have a choice. Friday. No one sent me an email. Friday. Friday. We're all Friday. Friday. Okay, so uh, we will meet on Wednesday and we'll finish up this chapter. Okay. Um, and then we don't have to have class on Friday. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right, let's just uh, review very quickly what we've said in our first hour. We talked about solubility. Remember our terminology. Solvent is the thing that does the dissolving. Solute is the thing that we dissolve. Solubility is a number. Magnesium carbonate, for example, is 0.53 grams per liter. If you have that in there, that's called a saturated solution. If you put more in and manage to get it in, that's called a supersaturated solution. We said that if a solution conducts electricity, we refer to that as an electrolyte. If a solution conducts, that's taken as evidence that we have ionization occurring. So that's sometimes when solutions or things dissolve, <coughs> you'll uh, see them described as an electrolyte. That just means they ionize in water. No ions, not electrolyte. We said that this happens because water has a dipole. It's a molecular dipole. Origin of that is the fact that water is bent. <clears throat> so you have a 109 degree angle between the two uh, hydrogens. And our dipole goes like this, positive end, negative end. We saw our Q buoy. And we saw that when ions dissolve in water, that an anion <clears throat> will be surrounded by the dipoles with the positive ends going in, and then a cation will be surrounded by dipoles with the negative ends 
pointing towards the eye. We talked about the concept of molarity. Molarity we simply defined as the number of moles in a liter of solution. It's important that you remember how to do this because it's not only a good lab skill, but molality, which I mentioned to you is going to come up, is done just the opposite way. With molarity, you start off with an empty flask, you put in a known number of moles of your solute. Then you add water, so your total volume is exactly one liter. Moles per liter. For molality, what you would do is take one liter of water, then you would add the solid. What happens is your volume goes up, doesn't it? That's why the two are different. <clears throat> but we're not doing molality this semester, only molarity. All right, simple calculation. Go ahead and work this one. This is potassium hydrogen phosphate. We have 238 grams of it, total volume of 275 mils. What is the molarity? We need to convert our mass to moles. Mass over molar mass is mole, right? Then divide that by our volume in liters. Mass over molar mass, 275 mils is 0.275 liters. Our grams cancel, per mole comes up, and we're left with just about five moles per liter. Three significant figures, 4.97 molar solution. Go ahead and do this one. All right, this is our concentration, isn't it? What volume do we need to have 0.01 moles of KCL? Simply divide moles by moles per liter. Our moles will cancel, per liter will come up. That will give us our volume in liters. Moles divided by moles per liter, moles cancel, per liter comes up top, we have 56 milliliters of solution. Yeah. 
Any questions? HCN, everybody's favorite poison, cyanide. We have a 1.25 molar solution of cyanide. That's 31 grams of cyanide. What is the total volume of this solution? So again, We've taken 31 grams of HCN. We've made a solution that I tell you is 1.25 molar. What's the volume that we have here? The same basic equation. Just remember that. Moles divided by volume is molarity, right? So here we need to simply take moles, divide it by molarity, and that's going to give us our volume. We have 31 grams. We know this stuff is 27 grams per mole. Mass divided by molar mass is moles. Know our molarity, know our number of moles, calculate our volume this way. Mass over molar mass is moles. Moles divided by our concentration, moles cancel, and we're left with 0.918 meters of solution. Any questions? Let's do one more <clears throat> quick review problem here. Going to expand our concept just a little bit to ions and solution. And then we're basically done with the first half of this chapter. How many sucrose molecules are present? if we have 300 mils of a two molar solution of sucrose. Now when you see this, you know, somebody said, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry. But that's only Avogadro's number, isn't it? So we need to figure out how many moles of sucrose we have, and then multiply it by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Trivia. We're going to do this <coughs> this way. We want the number of moles of sucrose. We have a volume and we have a molarity. Once we know the number of moles, we'll just use Avogadro's number and we'll do the number of molecules. Now, remember how I always say, and I always do, mass over molar mass is moles, and we all remember that, right? Here's another one to remember. So you have two things to say every day. Mass over molar mass is moles, concentration times volume is moles. Concentration, that's molarity, times volume in liters is moles. All right, so we are given a concentration, we're given a volume, so we know moles. Liter and per liter will cancel. Oops, we have 0.375 moles of sucrose. Where did you get the 1.25 from? 
1.25 liters. Oh, that's a mistake. It's still there. Yeah, this should be 1.25 up here now. Okay. okay, so problem's right, this is wrong. Change this to 1.25. All right, we take our number of moles, multiply it by molecules per mole. Moles will cancel. This represents 2.26 times 10 to the 23rd sucrose molecules. Key thing to remember in this problem is concentration times volume is moles. Any questions? All right, remember back when we were doing double replacement reactions, I had this really cute little flash thingy that I wrote where we drag stuff, put them in the beaker, and then the ions bounce around. That's how things ionize, right? Let's put this in terms of a problem. We have 2.5 molar sodium sulfate. If I asked you how many moles of sulfate we have in 150 mils, and how many moles of sodium are in the same volume, how would you do that? What we're going to do here is look at the mole ratio. Sulfate per sodium sulfate and sodium per sodium sulfate. Step one, we need to find out how many moles of sodium sulfate we have in 150 mils, right? Then we'll use our mole ratio to calculate moles of sulfate and moles of sodium. We have a concentration. We have a volume. Therefore, we have moles, don't we? If we know the number of moles, then we're just going to use the mole ratio to get sulfates and sodiums. So quickly, calculate the number of moles of sodium sulfate there are in our 150 mils. Concentration times volume is moles. 0.15 liter, 2.5 moles per liter, liter and per liter cancel. 0.38 moles of sodium sulfate. Now, as this dissolves in solution, one mole of sodium sulfate is going to give us one mole of sulfate, isn't it? Therefore, how many moles of sulfate? Well, it's the same thing. 0.38 sodium sulfates gives a mole ratio. 0.38 moles of sulfate. For every sodium sulfate, there are two sodiums. So, what's the molar concentration of sodium cation? It's simply two times this, or 
0.76 moles of sodium. Okay, the next couple of um, questions are actually questions off of exams where you were asked to show your work and stuff like that. We've done all of these. Let's just go ahead and do them. Pretend that this was an exam. All right, we have 248 grams of barium chloride. We know it's molar mass, and we know a volume. All we need to do is convert our mass into moles, convert our volume in mils into liters. Mass over molar mass is moles. Grams cancel, our per mole comes out. Gonna divide that by our volume in terms of liters. Do our simple calculation. We have 1.74 moles per liter. Now, part two of this question on the exam took your answer from this guy, and I asked this question. If we had one liter of this stuff, how many moles of barium ion would we have, and how many moles of chlorine would we have? So we have one mole of 1.74 molar stuff. How many moles of barium do we have? How many moles of chlorine? Just like we did with sodium sulfate, right? We need to look at our mole ratio here. We have barium chlorine. In every barium chlorate, there is one barium and there are two chlorates. One barium for every barium chlorate, two chlorates for every barium chlorate. So we simply take our 1.74. This is the same, isn't it? And this is twice as much. Any questions? And on this exam, I was also on a barium chlorate kick, I suppose. <laughs> I have a solution, this 0.174, so one-tenth of this, 
barium chloride. What volume do I need to give me 0.01 moles of this stuff? So we're solving for volume, right? If you remember a concentrationized volume is moles, and you want volume, take moles divided by concentration. Concentration times volume is moles. Divide our number of moles by our concentration. And that will give us our number of liters. Trivial problem, right? We have 0.01 moles. That's what we're looking for. We're 0.174 moles in every liter. Our moles cancel. The liter comes up. And we're looking at 0.057 or of course, 57 <coughs> milliliters. Now on your next exam, exam number three, you will have problems that will look very much like these. Please make sure you understand how to do these, how to do the things in the tutorials,